time. And let me ask you to open your Bibles, please, <clears throat> to the book of Proverbs, chapter 29. Proverbs, chapter 29. And we're going to read just the very first verse, Proverbs 29, verse 1. He, that being often reproved, hardeneth his neck, shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. The word reproof, or the verb to reprove, or past tense reproved, those words are used a total of 60 times in the scriptures. And we're getting some echo out here right now, so maybe we can reduce that. What is a reproof? What does it mean to reprove? Well, the, the, the Bible gives us a perfect explanation and definition of those terms and that term. The Lord Jesus said in John 3, verses 19 and 20, And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light. Why? Because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. To reprove means to expose something to the light, to show the truth of some matter. Not to shame someone or to uh, humiliate them, but hopefully to make uh, something better, to fix a problem. No one ever wanted their crimes or their failures or failings to be public knowledge. Nobody with a conscience wants their sin to be revealed. A reproof can be a, can be a gentle but a very firm admonition over something, or it might require a blunt criticism, depending on the act, or the action, or the attitude of the person. That's called a rebuke. It goes from reproof to becoming a rebuke when it's a little more severe. And let me begin at the very outset. I mentioned this a couple weeks ago in our Wednesday night Bible study with a personal story. I received a reproof back in well, the early part of 1991, and I'm so glad that I did. In 1990, my wife, and we had two little ones at the time, Daniel was less than three and Elizabeth was about nine, ten months. We moved to Pensacola so I could begin Bible school. I worked during the day, school was at night, and I didn't appreciate how bored she was at home with these two little ones. <laughs> and so uh, around after a few months, she flew back to California so she could see her family and see my family. And it was just going to be for a few weeks, but during that time my daughter fell and broke her leg, broke her femur. That bone had to be reset. Like I said, she was only about nine, ten months when we moved down there. And so the, the few weeks became a few months. And I was at, in Pensacola working, going to school, and uh, had a lot of free time. I'd hang out at the local fast food place. I'd take a book or some, something from school to go read and study. And a lot of people do that, but the more you're there, pretty soon these teenagers are coming out to take their their 15 minute break at your table. And uh, that led to one of the young girls that was the shift manager coming out there to take her break. And nothing beyond that ever transpired or, or took place, I should say. But I went to school that night and one of my teachers said, Brother Shrive, can I talk to you for a minute? Went in his office. And told me he had been in there at lunchtime and saw this girl sitting at my table. And it looked a little too familiar. I had nothing to say. He was absolutely right. I told him, you're absolutely right. I'll fix it right now. I'll fix it right now. And we prayed together. And um, for the next three years, I never went back to that restaurant. I didn't even go to the drive through And um, he could tell I had received that in the spirit it was intended. And um, that was Brother Ron Fort. And he retired now, but 
he and I became very good friends after that. And I'm so glad that he did. And um, <clears throat> address the problem right away, fix it right away, and uh, forsake it right away. But a reproof, let me back up a moment. When someone receives any shame or humiliation, uh, it's going to have to come from them, from the guilty party. You can't force it upon them. And um, I'm glad that I received the gentle kind, not a rebuke kind. But our text says, He that hardeneth his neck. To harden your neck is like hardening your heart. You become even more stubborn and more rebellious, and you try to talk your way out of something when someone's about to expose something you've been up to or something you've been doing. Well, you don't understand it. You're misreading it. It's not as bad as you think. Or why don't you mind your own business and so forth? Uh, that's why the, the verse reads, He that being often reproved. Some people don't just have hard hearts and hard necks. They also have hard heads. It takes a long time for them to learn something. So let me ask the question, how does your neck feel? How does your neck feel? Now, obviously, this sermon is about the word reproof, but to put sermon about reproof on the Internet, nobody's going to watch it. It's too boring. So you've got to put something, you know, to provoke their curiosity, prompt their curiosity. But point number one, Bible's examples. The first person to be reproved in our Bible was Sarah. In Genesis 20, Abraham was afraid that the men of Gerar would murder him and steal his wife away from him. So he told them, she is my sister, Genesis 20, verse 2. Thinking, you know, now they won't have to kill me. He was looking out for his own skin. And for some reason, Sarah went along with that ruse, with that deception. So the Lord told uh, Abimelech, the king of Gerar, in effect, I'll kill you if you touch her. She belongs to that man. She's that man's wife. So Abimelech gave Abraham silver and servants trying to undo whatever damage, whatever judgment he had already brought on himself. And then he tells Sarah, Behold, I have given thy brother <clears throat> a thousand pieces of silver. Behold, he is to thee a covering of the eyes unto all that are with thee. And with all other, thus she was reproved. Genesis 20, verse 16. Her lie about being Abraham's sister was exposed. She didn't think uh, Abimelech knew that much uh, about the matter. Abimelech turned out to have known more than she realized. And she had to accept that reproof, even if it made her look bad. Even if it made her look bad. But pride gets in the way. People don't want to look bad in the eyes of others. You're a Christian, you come to church, and you act very pious and spiritual and holy, and you're singing the song with more gusto than anybody else. That's a tip-off. There's something wrong with you. That's a tip-off. You're up to something, pal. That's why, you're, that's why you're singing so extra loud, aren't you? That should be the tip-off that somebody's up to something. And uh, you don't want your Christian friends to see you in a bad light. They don't want to, you, them to, you don't want them to discover that you've been doing something that is not very becoming of a Christian. And so you rationalize, you try to justify your actions and get around any sense of guilt whatsoever. But we read, and Abraham reproved, uh, or I should say, the next person that needed to be reproved was Abimelech himself. We read, Abraham reproved Abimelech because of a well of water which Abimelech's servants had violently taken away. Genesis 21, verse 25. Verse 26, And Abimelech said, I wot not, Old English, I know not, who hath done this thing. Neither didst thou tell me, neither yet heard I of it, but today. In that story, you learn that a reproof can still apply to something you should have known about by now. You should have known about it long before now. You're still obligated to make things right. Dr. Ruckman used to illustrate it this way. He'd say, uh, you're driving down the road, and the sheriff's department, police department, pull you over and give you a ticket for the stop sign you ran back there. And you tell the officer, I didn't know there was a stop sign. I didn't even see it. 
But that doesn't get you out of the ticket. They still give you the ticket because you could have seen the sign if you've been paying attention. Right. Let me ask you, if some sick person said, I never knew smoking cigarettes would cause cancer, how many of you would believe them? You got 100,000 people dead because of smoking over the last several decades, and the Surgeon General's warning been on every package of cigarettes for 60 years. There's no reason anyone should be ignorant of that. Claiming ignorance doesn't absolve you of your involvement, especially a king. So he had to receive the reproof. Job told his, told his three friends that if they spoke corruptly, claiming to speak for God, quote, he will surely reprove you, Job 13, verse 10. I wish the charismatics and the TV preachers and the Benny Hens and the and the Joel Osteens, all these people would learn that. You can't get away, you know, claiming to speak for God and all you are is a charlatan. It's going to come back. The Bible says, be sure your sin will find you out. Numbers 32, verse 23. Then in Job 40, verse 2, the Lord asked Job, Shall he that contendeth with the Almighty instruct him? He that reproveth God, let him answer it. Can you or any of your friends tell me, where I have been unjust or unfair in my creation or in my treatment of men? Speak up. Let's get it out in the open. Tell me about it. That's just like the Lord Jesus asking his enemies, which of you convinceth me of sin? John 8, 46. Of course, none of them could refer to a single case. King David realized that he, as a man, couldn't cite a single mistake that God had ever made. Thus I was as a man that heareth not, and in whose mouth are no reproofs. Psalm 38, 14. He couldn't say a word against God. He couldn't refer to a single time God had ever done wrong or mistreated the world. Psalm 50, verse 21, the Lord states, These things hast thou done. And I kept silence. Thou thoughtest that I was altogether such an one as, thou, as thyself. But I will reprove thee and set them in order before thine eyes. Well, what does that mean? Well, it means in the times of this ignorance, God winked at. He overlooked it. But now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Acts 17.30. That's what it means. Men seem to think that uh, God is a lot like them. He likes what I like. He hates what I like. He hates what I hate. He likes my favorite sports team. He'll laugh at the same jokes I laugh at. He'll look the other way if I'm flirting with somebody that's not my wife and so on. They deceive themselves. The Bible says, The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Jeremiah 17, 9. The Bible says, Because sentence against an evil work is not executed speedily, therefore the heart of the sons of men is fully set in them to do evil. Ecclesiastes 8, verse 11. They got away with one thing, and no repercussions, no immediate uh, punishment or consequences. Let's try something else. That's why the world's going to hell in a handbasket, and we're full of perversion everywhere. Started off people cheating on their spouse, Adultery. They become just people that live together. We didn't have to get married. They become the, the uh, sodomites and the perverts. Then it becomes people with children. Then it becomes people with animals. And that same descent uh, that's outlined in uh, Leviticus 18 is taking place in society right now. Right. As long as salvation before Calvary was dependent upon a man's good works, his own righteousness, and his degree of obedience to the laws of Moses, there was always that element of pride that could raise its ugly head. See what I've done. Look what I've done. Look what I achieved. So Paul says, not of works, lest any man should boast. And God reproves that kind of thinking. He exposes it to be false, and now commands all men everywhere to repent. Point number two. The Bible's Examples, Part 2. See, I'm real original with my points today. 
Our text says, he that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Without remedy means without relief, without a cure, without any reversal. When the thing has been exposed and you've been reproved over some matter you've been up to, you have only yourself to blame if you end up being punished or receiving some judgment of God for not making it right. For not making it right. Only yourself to blame. That's why the question, how many times have I told you not to do this, can have so many applications. Right? <laughs> whether it's at home, whether it's uh, some chore around the house, whether it's at school, whether it's at work, whether you're learning to drive a car, whether you're playing some sports, any, uh, any number of endeavors in life, that question is going to come up somewhere along the way. The Bible says, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledging of the truth. 2 Timothy 2, verse 25. Some people are their own worst enemies when it comes to admitting their guilt and owning up to their sin. It's because of pride. Pride gets in there. Judas was reproved for three and a half years walking with the Lord Jesus Christ as a sinner. That one who had never sinned was right in front of him. One who never spoke an unkind word. One who was completely pure and virtuous and impeccable. And uh, one who was without stain, without defilement. Someone like the world had never seen before. Just to be in the presence of Jesus Christ ought to bring conviction to somebody. And it certainly would have in that time. But in the end, Judas was destroyed without remedy. Zedekiah was the king of Judah for 11 years. And he was reproved by the words of the prophets and by examples of uh, failed kings before him. And he ended up rebelling against the king of Babylon at the time. And the king of Babylon came and they murdered his, Zedekiah's two sons in front of him. And then they put Zedekiah's eyes out so that those would be the last images he saw. And they took him away to Babylon as a servant from that time on. He rebelled, he hardened his neck, and he was destroyed without remedy. You can read about that in 2 Kings chapters 24 and 25. The people before the flood, what are often called the antediluvians, were reproved for 120 years while Noah was building the ark. Peter calls Noah a preacher of righteousness, 2 Peter 2, verse 5. And he said, when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a preparing, wherein few, that is, eight souls were saved by water, 1 Peter 3, 20. Millions of people, maybe billions, depending on the calculations, were destroyed without remedy. The entire world had hardened its neck against the preaching of Noah. Thirdly, Bible examples, part three. According to the Apostle Paul, uh, part of a preacher's job is to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. 2 Timothy 4, verse 2. To reprove is to bring up an error, to bring up a sin that you spot and someone's engaged in as tactfully as you can, like the general reproof I described earlier. If the person, especially another believer, rejects it, trying to explain themselves away and say it's not that bad and mind your own business and that sort of thing. They become even more stubborn in their ongoing sin. Then it requires a rebuke. That means to just ball them out. Do it publicly if that's necessary. Let it be known. And then to exhort with all long suffering and doctrine is going to mean to tell everybody else, don't do what brother so-and-so is doing. Don't do what sister so-and-so is doing. I don't want you to fail and stumble the way they have. Don't disgrace the name of the Lord Jesus Christ like they're doing. Most preachers can't get away with that these days because people have their rights. I have my right not to be offended. I have my right not to feel, have, have my feelings hurt. I need a comfort dog to make me feel better. All that crap. It's the world you're living in right now. But that's part of a preacher's job to reprove to rebuke and exhort with all long-suffering 
Long suffering, that's a beautiful word because it means you suffer a long time. You have to be very patient when someone else is uh, dragging their feet about getting right with God, admitting their guilt, repenting of their sin, and, and turning things around. Sometimes family members have to be long suffering with one who's rebellious against God. God. Go back, if you will, to Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27. Proverbs 27, notice there verses 5 and 6. Open rebuke is better than secret love. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Wouldn't you rather have someone who cares about you and someone who wants you to succeed to tell you when you've done something wrong, when you're planning to do something wrong, or something you've neglected to do? That needs to be made right and fixed so you can be pleasing in the eyes of God once again? Wouldn't you prefer someone who actually cares about you to tell you the truth? David wrote, Let the righteous smite me. It shall be a kindness, and let him reprove me. It shall be an excellent oil which shall not break my head. Psalm 141, verse 5. Finally, turn back to Proverbs chapter 1. Proverbs chapter 1, and let me begin reading there at verse 24. Because I have called, and ye refused, I have stretched out my hand, and no man regarded. But ye have said it not all my counsel, and would none of my reproof. I also will laugh at your calamity. I will mock when your fear cometh. When your fear cometh as desolation, and your destruction cometh as a whirlwind, when distress and anguish cometh upon you, then shall they call upon me, but I will not answer. They shall seek me early, but they shall not find me. For that they hated knowledge, and did not choose the fear of the Lord, they would none of my counsel, they despised all my reproof. That's the Lord warning a rebellious and, and a wicked Israel, and everybody else. Listen, I have tried to do it a gentle way. I have tried to be kind. There was a reading of the law among the, the uh, nation uh, continually. There were the sacrifices being offered by the Levites in the tabernacle and the temple daily, every day, every night, especially in the feast days and the holy days. There were the prophets God sent along to remind them to turn back to God and turn from their wickedness to break down their idols and so forth. And so many of them didn't repent. They didn't get right with God. They went on in their wickedness, just like Ecclesiastes 8.11 says, they get away with it now, they think they're always going to get away with it. Just as Christ said, I am the light of the world, he that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. John 8, verse 12. I'm so glad that as ignorant as I am about so many things, the light of Jesus Christ is able to pierce my head, pierce my brain, pierce my thought, pierce my feelings, and bring some conviction to me from time to time. And the Word of God can do the same um, as uh, thick-headed as I might be. That the light of Jesus Christ is still able to get through an ignorant man like me. Hallelujah. I'm glad that I came to the light of the Lord Jesus Christ November 5th, 1967. A long time ago. 52 years nearly. He says, And everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. The resentment of being reproved or being exposed is what keeps many from trusting Jesus Christ as their Savior, to be the forgiver of their sins, the one who can guarantee their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life, that there's a home in heaven waiting for them, that their soul, their spirit rather, is regenerated by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. They don't want any of those things because they'd rather hang on to what they want to hang on to. My dad's great at saying, in the end, people are going to do what they want to do. Right. You expose it, you reprove it, it comes to light. 
They'll try to rationalize, them, rationalize it and explain themselves away and say it's not that big of a deal when it can be a very big deal. Think of it this way. Doesn't the Apostle Paul say, what concord hath Christ with Belial? What uh, communion hath, a fellowship hath light with darkness? What uh, communion hath uh, he that believeth with an infidel? And so on. 1 Corinthians 6, 2 Corinthians 6, long in there, those places. So the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. According to Ephesians 2, 6, you've already been raised to sit in heavenly places in Jesus Christ. There's part of you that's in the third heaven already. Thank the Lord for that blessing. I'm waiting for my body to be changed and my, my transformation to become complete. All the sins in the past have been forgiven and put away under the blood of Jesus Christ. The perfect righteousness of Christ now covers you when God sees you. He doesn't see you uh, covered in your own wickedness and, and perversion any longer. He now sees you covered with the perfection of His own Son. Amen. Uh, the Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You and every other believer are knit together by the same Holy Spirit dwelling in each one of you. He gives you a perfect Bible that you can have 100% uh, confidence in from cover to cover. You don't have to doubt it. You can say with certainty, my name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. And if I died right now, I'd wake up in heaven with Jesus Christ. You are called the beloved. You are called a saint of Jesus Christ. You don't have to wait for the Catholic Church to make you a saint. They'll never make you a saint. They'll make somebody who is a, a you know, a beer drinker, a beer maker, uh, a saint before they make you a saint. But you are a saint of Jesus Christ. Why in the world would you go to an unsaved person and say, listen, I want to party with you. Let's have some fellowship. You can't have fellowship with them. you got nothing in common with them. You will disgrace Jesus Christ in doing so. You'll bring shame and dishonor to the name of the Lord Jesus, to the Savior who suffered for your sake on the cross. That's what you'll do. When that other person realizes that you're a true believer and you're just as rotten as they are, You'll damn their soul. That's what you'll end up doing. You'll damn their soul. They'll never need to get saved. Why should I get saved? That person is no better than I am. That's what they'll say. But the resentment of being exposed, the resentment of being reproved, not only does it keep people from trusting Christ, it prevents fellowship between the believer and the Savior. It prevents fellowship between one believer and another believer. It gets in the way. It's pride. Human pride. Let me bring this to a close. It can lead to eternal consequences, too. No, no rewards at the judgment seat of Christ. It's one thing to complete something. It's another to get a, a pat on the back by someone whose who's, who's, uh, uh, compliment you actually appreciate and want. I want that from Jesus Christ one day. He that being often reproved hardeneth his neck shall suddenly be destroyed, and that without remedy. Let's bring this to a close.